I have um, always experienced Stein's poetry and a lot of Stein's writing as resist, you know, as not needing to have a fixed meaning or maybe having multiple meaning possibilities. And that's one of the things I've enjoyed about Stein over the years is like different critics interpret her differently and I at different moments in my life or different like moments in my day interpret her differently. And I feel like that is sort of part of her um, project, you know, the idea of repetition, which is also some of the things that you gave us to read, you know, that her no, no, hold the floor. her use of repetition and the idea that a rose is a rose is a rose and each rose is different, you know, that you're at a different moment when you read that second rose and so you un- it's, it has a different meaning for you. I do feel like um, this line about an arrangement in a system to pointing is really fascinating and a little vexing because I I'm having tr- like I have this kind of feeling that there's a meaning for it that I'm yearning for, <laughs> so I experience a little moment of yearning there, but I'm not arriving at a meaning right now, or I'm arriving at lots of fragments of meaning Such in my mind. What are some fragments that that are bouncing around? Well, you know, system. She could be using system in a really kind of loving way. Like she could be using it to refer to something that is hers to play with, like grammar. Or it could be that she's using it in a somewhat oppressive way. And an arrangement in a system and the system's pointing, you know, so is it a sort of a punitive system or an overly um, sort of controlling system? And then if, like we... Like Bob was saying, if you know, there's this. I also read the the carafe in the mirror. I sort of assumed that the spectacle was referring to reflection, and the cousin was maybe referring to reflection and something lesser than or different than the real, quote unquote. And what does that have to do with the system? I have questions there, and I'm really enjoying those questions. And I think that's for me always been a lot of the pleasure of reading Stein is that there's like multiple possibilities for understanding or hypothesizing. And then Bob, you had a, a, point, a number of points to follow Caroline. Take the fourth. Yeah, we were, we were talking about it during the um, uh, hiatus in recording. And um, uh, to me, I read Spectacle as a, a glasses, a pedestrian interpretation. And um, uh, I felt that, again, a system to pointing was uh, talking about language and um, the difficulty in it. I agree with you in terms of the ambu- ambiguity, and I think that ambiguity and obfuscation is, is built into this. Uh, I think that's part of what she's saying, is the, the difficulty of uh, using language to communicate. And I think that it's no coincidence that this leads the entire tender buttons. It's the very first thing in, in, in the object section. Mm-hmm. So... I, I really think that you know all this not already not unordered and not resembling is is talking about the system of of how we communicate how we think and use these tokens of words you know and move them around so I, I think she's drawing on that you know one of the things you uh, mentioned on reading was about what she's saying about uh, nouns a noun is the name of anything why after a thing is named write about it a name is adequate or is it not you know that what does a name mean? These names we give things. So I think that what she's talking about is the whole process of using language. And mm-hmm. she's saying that it's it's not working as well as it did. Mm-hmm. Okay. Rodney, what do you think? <coughs> the fork is yours. Uh, <coughs> I actually didn't understand this until I read Marjorie Perloff. So there. And a single hurt color, for instance, is red, red wine. Um, Wittgenstein says that Stein is not using language for information, but is making it strange, forcing us to be acutely aware of the way words work. Here, for example, is the first of the objects in Tender Buttons, a craft that is a blind, which is an important um, important point about Stein, I think. But that's this 
poem seems easier easier than the ones that follow it. <laughs> Here, can you film me? Yeah. Horizontally. Well, something I I wonder about how we can consider um, the carafe itself. Though, of course, we can't access the carafe without the word carafe. There is no picture of a carafe or, or a literal carafe. Mm. We're not at a tavern where we have a carafe among us. We just have, like, you can look through this at me. We we just have cups of plastic cups of coffee um, but uh, an arrangement and a system to pointing does does we understand that how do we understand that if that refers to the object that the word carafe refers to or do we see this as not about the object that carafe corresponds to, but about the word carafe itself and the work that it's doing as an object being a word. You know, but what does a carafe do? You, you use a, you fill a carafe with something wine. in the same way, yeah, wine, water. You can fill it no, with you anything. can't fill it with water. Sure you can. Carafe only for wine. <laughs> <laughs> no, you could fill it with orange juice. Uh, well, there's, a, there's an example of juice. interpretation. <laughs> well, I think filling it with wine is an example of interpretation. Well, it's two. They're both, yeah. yeah. But here she says... Wait, here. The, here. The, the thing is, the, oh. if I might point out, though, the craft is empty until you put something into it in the same way that we put meaning into words. <laughs> well, she's saying here... Uh, that it's a single hurt color red, which is the color of wine. So mm -hmm. that's that's why I took it to be a wine glass. Okay. Why is it hurt? That's a good question. Why is it hurt? Because it's about to be drunk, I guess. <laughs> 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 okay. Here, give it back. Here. 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 I was just going to say that that hurt. I mean, if you look at the the words in here you know blind um, hurt um, yeah and so I mean this is why a lot of people when we were discussing the, the poem you know in the, the forums a lot of people interpret this positively but I just I don't see to me that's bolting on some uh, optimism to it because I, I don't see that here but in a way that's ambiguous you can Mm -hmm. How do you see it positively? One of the pleasures of it, of her writing, is that it's inspired this tremendous body of theorizing, but some of which is still going on. And, you know, so you can read other people sort of grappling with what she's doing, both in micro, like in individual poems, and like just her overall project. And it's fascinating. I mean, obviously, you know, people, it's like a Talmudic, you know, people are sort of arguing about how to interpret certain things that she did, and, and also about her as a figure, obviously. Like, she's a very ambiguous figure, too, to the extent that that matters. But to me, it's just a pleasure to, you know, depending on what I'm reading or thinking about or what I've read about her recently, I can go back and have a completely different experience with something she's written. Now, I haven't read Tender Buttons now, in a long, long time. I think I read it maybe in college or right after college, most recently. Maybe I read a little bit here or there. And I'm sure I'm having a completely different, like, top to bottom experience with it. And that's pleasurable. It's different than going back to, you know, something that is guiding you much more deliberately through a narrative. And you can still go back to something like that, like, you know, Robert Frost or, you know, something that's more maybe uh, guiding you towards a specific understanding of the poem and still have a different relationship to it after 25 years but you know I find her to really engage my own understanding of words and grammar and to a certain extent politics very differently each time wait why what did you just I'll react just to say that um, she had a uh, 
very intense relationship with painters right. and painters at the turn of the century and after that who did not who were not realistic who almost did what she's doing in paint you know and I th that's fascinating so I don't know who came first I think the painters came first and then she decided to put that kind of composition into her poems you have to take the <laughs> and she was also very influenced by some of the linguists who were writing right after the turn of the century. And I think that, like, these sort of new excavations of language were part of her sphere of influence, too. Well, when we uh, went through a portrait of uh, Picasso in the class, um, that, that's an interesting poem you know, with the repetition and the words and whatnot. And um, I was reminded uh, in the Ducamp's the New Dispending a, a Staircase, what you have there is an extended now, that, that view of it. You know, in Cubism, you've got all these different views of the same thing at the same time. But I think that the, the concept of now is extended there. And I think in some ways, one of the techniques she's using is that repetition to divorce us from... Because, you know, when we read, it's one word after another, you know, and this thing, you know, we go down, you know, left to right. And how do you get out of that? How do you escape that? And I think that that's what she's doing with her repetition, mm. is she's, she's trying to just expand that space to give you that same effect. So. Well, what, what do we make of, of the phrase, of, of this, the, the penultimate sentence of this? All this and not ordinary, not unordered, and not resembling. Well, we don't make anything of it, but <laughs> let's see. Well, what does it mean? So there's ordinary and not unordered. Ordinary would be a glass, and uh, not unordered means it is un it is ordered. So it's a glass that is. Uh, fit for something to use, to use. But that there's an order beyond resemblance. Yes, yes. Uh, what, would it, what, resem what would resemblance be? <laughs> well, we can, I think, go back to um, what Bob said, what Bob said about the blind glass being a mirror and that this is a kind of glass that doesn't reflect well I, the blind glass being a mirror I, I mean especially how much we read into things you know because of what we're bringing to it mm -hmm. I think is very evident in these poems but all this and, and not ordinary not unordered and not resembling um, can be read as I ordered and not resembling or um, not unordered and resembling because of the double. So the, either way, it, it's either uh, ordered or unordered and helping you in resembling something or not resembling it. And again, I think this relates to words. And I felt that the not ordinary in, in that interpretation of it could possibly relate to... Um, You've got language, and it points to something. And it points to one thing, but what is not ordinary, it can't. It does not point to, you know, because it's outside of the, what you can express in that language. Oh, that's great. So that was the way I took that. There's something very curious in Marjorie Perloff's uh, article. She said Stein herself insisted that tender buttons was entirely realistic. Yeah, that's just in the tradition of Gustave Flaubert, I used to take objects on my table like a tumbler or any kind of object and try to get the picture of it clear and separate in my mind and create a word relationship between the word and the thing seen. The relationship between the word and, and the, the thing, thing seen. seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this is the first sorry, the fact that this is the first one in there again. I, I think means everything that follows, that's what she's doing. She's defining that relationship between the word and the thing seen. Mm -hmm. uh, 
know, the way you describe it and what is being described. Right. Well, so. and also, and also opening up the possibility of new. What happens if if one gives an array of new language to an object that doesn't already belong to it? So a carafe is a noun that refers to a thing, but what if um, I think to be literal about it, we could think of the language not that Stein is using metaphor, but to think metaphorically about it, we have the carafe that is filled not only with wine, but with this language inside of it in the same way that um, the wine doesn't belong necessarily to the carafe, but, but does once you put it in, in the same way that once we add this flow of language and, and attach it just through juxtaposition to the carafe, that language is now something in the carafe. Well, it, it's, uh... and, and, and in the same way, I think as an opening poem, in the same way, if we think about uh, the point of a carafe is not to permanently hold wine, it's to ultimately pour it out and share and get drunk and talk with less inhibition that in a sense we can think of this as the liquor language as as inebriating language that allows us to disinhibit our one-to-one -one pre given attachments between words and things and to allow things to um, swirl with with new language that perhaps allows us not only to see the object differently but to see the potential of language differently that's that's my thought here you go so you're another optimist <laughs> <laughs> I, well well I want to talk I think it's important that we talk about what what you're saying and and whether or not um, languages precision whether I'm, I'm filming Bob no 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 you don't have to take me but it's because I'm addressing Bob whether the idea of losing languages precision is necessarily or, or why that would why you would feel that would be um, negative and I think it's important to remember that Stein is originally a scientist, a biologist. So she is coming from an initial relationship of language to things that is certainly um, uh, that where language fastens onto things with extreme precision. Because yeah, you wouldn't, right? You wouldn't want your surgeon to have a playful relationship with language. <laughs> so, or would you? Um, and what would that mean? But I'm, I'm curious about going a little further into thinking about the difference between... I, I don't think that it's a matter of being an optimist or... Well, uh, well it is. It's a matter of, of how one considers the value of the relationship of language to thing. Uh, I agree with you, and my negative interpretation of this is solely based on the fact that um, hurt and blind. Mm. I don't see anything in here that, that gives a positive uh, connotation to it. So if, if that's what she is talking about, you know, why is there nothing in here that, that says that? Why is there painful words in here or words where you can't see something? But nothing, nothing the opposite, and, and that's why I cousin. take that interpretation. Don't you take cousin positively, or do you have bad relationship with your cousins? Yes, I, <laughs> I, I never had any good cousins. Okay. <laughs> I have a good cousin. Yeah. And cousins is also the term used to refer to the CIA, but I think that came later. So. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, I personally, I did, I can't say that I get. Um, 
negative feeling from this poem. I think there it, there are words that are deliberately a little ominous, and there's an, there are you know clusters of words together that are ominous, but um, but I don't experience that as negative. I feel like. Um, I'm understanding from her as I understand from other things I've read of her that she's aware of threats and I think one of the you know obviously I think one of the things that like maybe is to me a little unclear in this poem is exactly where she's locating the threat I mean I do sense an ominous quality here and to me it is that system to pointing is is part of it and I yeah the word hurt and I don't think I find this just playful. And I don't quite know what to make of the differences spreading. Like that could be this really joyous sort of declaration or it could be something that, you know, is meant to be joyous or painful depending on, you know, the moment that you're reading this poem. I'm curious. I mean, I do feel like there's a threat in this. No two instances are ever identical. Yeah. Even when the same phrase is used, repeated over and over again, as is common in Stein, there is always difference. That's mm -hmm. yeah. Like, what if the difference spreading was spreading? Out. Was yeah. repeated five times. Right. Like the difference is spreading. The difference is spreading. The difference. <laughs> you know, you could really understand how open-ended that is, and how, I guess, generative or fecund that open-endedness can be. I'm still obsessed with this blind glass being a mirror and that in the title the carafe comma that is a blind glass or a mirror and and blind glass implies an inability or a, a kind of incapacity to see and we think of glass as being something transparent or reflective or as the transparent as seeing through like a window or transparent and seeing within like seeing the wine within the carafe um, but what would it mean um, for the carafe that doesn't resemble or the word that doesn't resemble the object that it names um, what, what would it be to look in a mirror and not to see oneself? And I think that in a way this is, the poem allows us to, it deflects our projections of assuming we know what we're looking at and assuming we, um, that our language is as transparent as glass well i think she doesn't i think she would definitely not agree with the transparency of language mm -hmm. i i think that's something also she doesn't mention here mirror or glass she leaves them out this blind glass oh a corrupted is a blind glass is, yeah. is a mirror i never want to rush to your dictionaries <laughs> Right, well, she leaves out eyeglasses, for instance. But she has spectacles. Spectacles, that's true. Well, that's a spectacle. That's a joyous, um, mad celebration. Not spectacles well, that you <laughs> see with. Don't be so literal. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't make a spectacle well, of yourself. Spectacle is more literal than what I just said. Spectacle as eyeglasses is very literal. And uh, I don't think she's ever liter literal. I still have trouble with in a system to pointing. Uh, we well, describe that as language not or language that is useful to dis to point at an object, mm -hmm. didn't we? Yeah. And I guess that's what she's saying there too. But a carafe, and a carafe, though, is, is unusual. It's not a pitcher. It doesn't have a spout. Right. So it doesn't exactly point to the person who will 
to the thing into which the contents will be poured. It's a kind of, it could be poured for anyone. Um, and I always think of the differences spreading as the wine leaching across the tablecloth, which is my own private association based on nothing. I, I think we have a, a question of what is the purpose of writing, or in this instance, in Stein writing, you know, and mm -hmm. is she trying to, the first question is, is she trying to communicate? Mm -hmm. And then the second is, if she's trying to communicate, what is it she's trying to communicate? Mm -hmm. You know, and is she trying to communicate that the fact that there is ambiguity, you know, the fact that the spectacle can mean glasses or it could mean, you know, an event, that she's that's what she's trying to communicate that there is this open interpretation and that you know you can get all these things out of it but I think that there in, in everything that we look at in terms of the poem there's always a question of you know were they intending to communicate and if so what what if but what if she's not trying to communicate that's the other that you didn't address the other answer uh, if she's not, and I did say if, the first question right. is, is she trying to communicate? Right. And if she's not, then what is the purpose of disseminating this? Uh, what's what the are purpose of... What people do that aren't communicative? Things with their hands, and they're communicative, I guess. Right. Is Think. building, is <laughs> like, a, is an architect communicating? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. But in a different but not in a linear informational sense. Oh, space very much influences what happens in that space. Right, exactly. So when you're creating that space, yeah, you're making a statement about what interactions you expect in there. So yeah, I would say architects communicate. Well, I would wonder if, if Stein is communicating more like an architect and less like a writer. Maybe. And just assembling a space for something to happen? Mm -hmm. What, what we're, we're forgetting here is that this is erotic, and erotica, you can tell that by the title alone, and how that... How, do you, how does the title tell you? Tender Buttons. Oh, Tender Buttons. Yeah. Um, how this fits into that theme, I don't know. It's what they're getting drunk. <laughs> well, then they're going to be having some erotic activity after that. Yeah. <laughs> well, so maybe that's a little bit of a spreading. <laughs> 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 Ooh, how about that? Wait, wait, we have to get that. I'm going to solve the poem. Well, I was responding to Rodney, who was <laughs> reminding us that Tender Buttons is this erotic work, and I was saying, okay, spreading, so what if the difference is spreading, may, what if that's erotic and not about either, you know, some sort of viral spreading or dangerous, you what if it's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, what if it is? <laughs> I also feel like I wish I had more memory of some of the linguistic theory that, you know, like Saussure and Jacobson that was really changing the way people were experiencing language around the time Stein, you know, and before Stein was writing. I do feel like, um, you know, if there's one thing that I feel is fixed about Stein's writing, it's the intelligence and the rigorousness, which seems weird when you're talking about something so playful and open-ended, but because I don't have enough framework in my conscious mind right now to go very deep with that, doesn't mean that one can't. Like, I feel like there's a lot of scaffolding here that I don't have easy access to right now. But that, you know, when I studied Stein, some of my professors did, and you really begin to see how brilliant this is and how many different tethers, philosophical and linguistic and political tethers, she's sort of pulling together here. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that. No, no, <laughs> not talk, we're not going to talk about that yet. <laughs> All right, so so let's have let's have a final comment. Who were Caroline's? All right, we can leave it with Caroline's. But um, my final comment is that it's an extraordinary poem, both in its um, pleasure and in its uh, confusion. And my final comment is, I am just astonished that something written over a hundred years ago can be so fresh and challenging and uh, thought-provoking. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I would think that something bad would be old and tired and nothing like that at all. I mean, that's that's genius. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, do you have another final, another final comment? <laughs> so let's see. The final, final comment. Um, Your final. No, I feel like uh, it's interesting. There was that big exhibit of Stein's art at the Met a few years ago that ended up being really controversial because it sort of omitted certain things about her biography that people felt were important. And it was kind of fascinating to me because I felt like, okay, her person, her personal history, her biography, her writing, her philosophy, her politics, like it's all still being interpreted. And like, I feel like, uh, what was that thing that, James Joyce famously said, like, uh, I'll keep the English professors guessing for a thousand years or something after he published Ulysses. I do feel, and she was just as, like, bragged, just as much of a braggart as he was in her own way. And I feel like um, she also, like, she's keeping everyone guessing for her thousand years or whatever. The politics were not, uh, are not uh, to be... Um, Say it again. Her politics are not to be uh, glamorized. She didn't pay any attention to World War II and she lived in a house in a Nazi-occupied area of France and just uh, treated the soldiers as um, not comrades but visitors. Okay. She translated Pétain into English. Wait, say that again. She translated Pétain. I can't remember his first name, but he was the head of the Vichy. Philippe. Philippe Pétain yeah. into English. 